Right, Hi, let's Michelle. get started because we're right um, happening up to the hour um, and we will say hello to everyone who's online here. It looks like you've got a bit of a fan club, Unkush, which is lovely. Um, should I say Ankush or Unkush? Uh, you can call me Unkush or you can call me Kush. Either, either works. Oh, we're on, we're on nickname basis already, Kush. This is the second time we've had a Zoom together, so maybe I can call you that by now. Um, welcome everyone to the evening session of the Superhuman Summit. This is day five, and this, um, I've got to remember it's the reverse. This is our last speaker of the day, Ankush Jain. And don't think that means that he's going to be not good because he's on the witching hour, but it's only 10 a.m. bright and early for you in the UK in London. Isn't that right, Ankush? It is, yes. This is uh, early morning over here. Early morning. And we have so many people here starting to roll in um, that you can just see the numbers starting to tick up as people are joining to listen in. So hello, let's say a quick hello to everyone. Jyoti and we've got Anusha I was talking to earlier. Hello, Ravi. Hello, Mahubub. Again, you're an epic attendee. Thank you for your attendance once again. Um, we've got Jilly is in New Zealand. Oh, and you know Ankush. That's lovely. Um, and hello, Suren. Surendra, is it? Lovely to have you. And you're in a rural village in India. How beautiful, wonderful to have you join us as well. We've been blown away um, and we've got someone Oh, yes, Mahubo bin Abu Dhabi. Fantastic to have you on again. We have had people from over 15 countries so far on the Superhuman Summit. We have just uh, about to complete day five. There's still three days to go and still more epic um, speakers to come. But without further ado, we're going to get into tonight. Hello, everyone in Facebook land. I can see people starting to join over there as well. Um, now, I'll be moderating throughout. I'm AJ. I'm one of the co-founders of the Human Power Superhuman Summit. My colleague, Michelle, who is my co-founder, is in the Facebook group. For people who are here in Zoom, if you weren't already in the Facebook group, you can join the Facebook group, which is called the Superhuman Summit. And that's where you can watch replays. You can chat to the speakers after their talks. You can get offers and get downloads and things that they share, as well as just be part of the community, which is now over 600 people around the world are part of that Facebook forum. So please feel free to hop in there. All of this is completely free. And all of our amazing 40 speakers just like Ankush over here, have donated their time because we all want to see the consciousness of humanity and the world raised right now in these interesting times that we're going through. So Ankush tonight is going to talk about um, an interesting take on the superhuman um, kind of title. And um, I think he's going to be a little... Um, perhaps controversial maybe, <laughs> um, but we're really looking forward to this. He's gonna talk about the secret behind radical transformation. And I think during this time that we're facing unprecedented challenges, we need to be able to deal not only with challenges at work, but we're having to deal with things at home. And also we're being bombarded with what's going on in the media about what's happening around the world. And people are finding that I think a struggle um, in lots of ways. And yet we are finding our way through with support and advice from beautiful humans like Ankush here. Ankush is a leadership and business coach. He is based there in London and he's an author as well. And I'm looking forward, maybe at the end, you can share some of the books and things that you've been writing on. Um, and he's the founder of a powerful men's group and has run sold out powerful men's immersions in the UK for over five years. So he um, is available on LinkedIn as well. So go and check him out, Ankush Jane. Um, K, isn't it, in between there? And then um, yeah. check him out on Facebook and also on LinkedIn. I'll be sure to put some links in here for you. And in Facebook land, we'll pop some links in for you as well so you can connect with Ankush. But without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to you to Tell us more about your topic this evening. Well, thank you, AJ, for the, for the introduction. And, and thank you for inviting me to speak to this wonderful summit that you, you guys have created over here. Um, and, and excited to be talking to people from, from all around the world. Um, yeah, I, I, I hope I don't get cut off. Maybe this will be controversial. Maybe it won't. Uh, maybe you'll just say, no, we need to get him off the air. But, uh, but hopefully it won't, it won't be too, uh, too crazy. Um, it, it's a really interesting 
uh, title of the summit, the Superhuman Summit. And I've been reflecting over the last few days around, you know, how exactly I'm going to share what I've been sharing with the, the slant around superhuman. And, you know, what I thought about was what I used to be like, you know, if I go back 20 years or so. And if I go back in time, if you like, um, it really looked to me like the world was becoming more and more challenging, even 20 years ago. It looked like that if you wanted to start your own business, you know, all the best business ideas had been taken and, oh, if only I was born 20 years earlier, it would have been easier. Um, it looked like staying in a career was, was uh, more and more difficult and challenging and business problems were becoming more complex and the world was becoming more complex. Um, and, and we had it, you know, all these other challenges. And so superhuman would have been something that I would have been aiming to throughout kind of my, my, my twenties to achieve. And, um, that was my journey, if you like, into, uh, what might be determined uh, called personal development, right? How can I develop myself? How can I build the skills and, uh, inner strength? to be superhuman, to really thrive in a world that was, you know, ever more challenging. And that did have some really positive impact. So I think that um, there are a lot of great things that we can learn that I'm sure many of your speakers have been sharing that other people around the world share um, that I listen to e even now that can be really helpful. And you know, just to give you some kind of background, uh, the things I did to, to try and be superhuman uh, was I hired an image consultant from New York to make sure I presented myself well. Um, I spent a year getting uh, elocution lessons uh, from a lady um, who, who kind of taught actors and, and drama students to project my voice and to enunciate what I was saying again to communicate more effectively. Um, at work, I was always bugging my boss to put me on the latest training program, the latest management training, whatever I could get my, hold my hands on, you know, like anything that will help me get the edge to improve, to do better. I, I would try and get access to that. Um, I did Alexander technique, which is all about kind of posture and again, presenting yourself well. And, um, I really pushed myself, you know, we hear this as well, outside of my comfort zone. So I, I almost had a way of being in the world, which was if something looks scary to me, I therefore need to do it because that, then I will be growing. Right. And if I'm not growing, then, then it, especially in a world where, where things were getting or, or looked like they were getting more and more challenging, I, I, I would be shrinking back. And so over about 10 or 11 so perhaps years, other oh. people, um, you were talking about 20 years ago and 10 years ago, perhaps other people, if they were the same and were a bit of into that course junkie, maybe you didn't do Alexander technique and elocution lesson, lessons, lessons, <laughs> it obviously worked for you and not for me. Um, perhaps you can put in the chat box a why, a why for yes, if you were someone who um, goes to every course you could and, you know, was always looking for learning, reading lots of books and training. And yeah, here we go. They're starting to come in. You know, if that was you as well, 10 to 15, 20 years ago. Sorry, continue. No, no, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. And, and I love the interactive nature of this. So yeah, please do, do interact with us. Um, and, and, I, and I don't want to knock that time because I did learn a lot. Um, and, and it did help me in this things that I learned from that time that have still stayed with me that have been, that have been useful. Um, but what was interesting was it was, um, it really felt like I, I couldn't stop. <laughs> it really felt like it was, it was never enough. And, and I put a lot of pressure on myself and, and, you know, maybe other people do this, maybe it was just me, but I put a real uh, high bar on, on what I had to be. So superhuman would have been a really great word to use because it was like, good is not good enough, right? It was like, I, I need to be the best. I need to be better than is possible. It was, 
And it really looked like putting that pressure on myself and really, really pushing myself to be better and better and better was the best way to, to, to thrive in the world. And um, there were, like I said, there were positives of it, but, it, but also there was this kind of feeling deep down inside that I was never good enough. Because the bar was so high, I, I could never meet it. So I was on this hamster wheel, you know, just kind of trying to run faster and faster and faster. And, and often people around me would be impressed or, wow, Ankush, you've really changed. I'm just wondering, what was your self-talk at the time whilst you were on this, you know, more and more, I'm never enough and some of that not good enough. What, what kind of self-talk was going on in your mind at the time? I, I think I was a bit of a schizophrenic because the conscious self-talk was very positive because I'd learned that. Right. And I remember, you know, I would walk around every morning doing, and maybe again, some of you have done this, the Tony Robbins thing of like every day in every way I'm feeling better and better. Yes. And I was like doing his incantations and that talk was very positive. But when I wasn't doing the conscious talk, there was, if I'm really honest, there was often a lot of negative self-talk that crept in. You should know better than this. You've been learning this for long enough. Um, you know, you idiot, you, you know, whatever. And so I was kind of schizophrenic that I thought I had to be this person and present myself in that way to the world. And then anytime I didn't feel like that, it, it became it became almost a secret shame that I couldn't even tell anyone because I was presenting myself as this person who was really aiming high and trying to do well and, and whatever, that it became really hard to be more open and honest and vulnerable to go, I still don't get it or I'm, I'm struggling with this, which got in my own way. And I'd love everyone again to share a, a yes or a no, a Y or an N in the Facebook group as well. Michelle just said driver thriver mindset. Yes. Please put a Y or an N if this has been your experience as well. I think we had some discussion earlier today with one of our other speakers, um, Sally, who talked about that imposter syndrome that some people have or many of us have and that often it's just not talked about widely enough and particularly um in males in corporate as well so yes we've got ravi faith yes <laughs> surin shami yes lots of people jilly lots of people saying yes so um I'm sure lots of people can relate to what you're talking about with that I'm not good enough kind of mindset and also that imposter syndrome of I better not say anything because people will find me out. So tell us, leap forward to how did things change? What happened then? Well, funnily enough, I, I got to a stage after about 12 years that my mind settled down and I finally got to a stage where I was like, I'm good enough. And I think it was just, staying in the game for long enough perhaps and i i stopped and i thought right i don't need any more personal development doesn't mean i know everything doesn't mean i'm perfect but for right now i'm okay and it was the first time in in, in a very long time probably ever that i'd felt like that and and what i did was i i decided to to, uh, well, I'm not decided, I, I had a, an aha moment, I had an, uh, an epiphany, um, which was you've spent all this time learning about personal development, personal growth, you know, um, peak performance. This is, why don't you share this with other people? Why don't you help other people? And it was something that I had, people had told me for years, oh, you, you know, you love this stuff. You, have you thought about coaching? Have you thought about training? Have you thought about helping other people? And I was always like, no, that's not for me. This is what I do. This is my hobby. Right. Um, but no, I'm a, I'm a corporate guy. I'm a career guy. You know, th this isn't a real job. And so I always like pushed it away. And, and so the, like I had this insight on a Sunday or a Monday and, and, just over a week later, I'd signed up to a year long program to be a coach, right? It was very, very quick from having the idea to, to taking action on it. And 
on that journey, I accidentally, like complete fluke, um, got got into a world. Um, and it was funny because I said to the to the trainer, like, I'm not looking for any more personal development. I've been around the block a little bit. I've done lots of it. I just want to help other people. And and he smiled and he knew he was like, okay, no problem. Just just come on the course. And I got introduced to a deeper understanding of how the mind works. And what was really interesting is um, the, it, it was originally um, described by a guy called Sidney Banks. And Sidney Banks would often talk about being ordinary, right? And that really didn't make sense to me. I was like, whoa, 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 hold on a second. I don't want to be ordinary. I've spent you know, so much of my life not being trying to be the opposite of that but what was really interesting was encouraging being ordinary is that what you're saying he was saying be content yeah with being that's what it sounded like to me and he used the word ordinary right not extraordinary not special not superhuman just ordinary now i would have dismissed this had i not spent thousands of pounds <laughs> signed up to a course um but also the people that I, um, so Sydney Banks, when I started learning this had, had passed away and, but there were a group of psychologists and trainers who were, who were sharing what they'd learned from him. And they seemed extraordinarily happy. They seemed to me to, to be what we might call superhuman, right? Their, their marriages, you know, these were people who were married for 40 years and not just still in love with each other, like, yeah, what are you going to do? Well, I'm married to her, you know, her, her, whatever. It was like, no, they were really in love. You know, they would talk about their partners with such affection and love that they were acting like newlyweds, which was very unusual. Um, they would be genuinely happy and, and calm and content. And when, when any of them, a lot of them were in the UK, um, they would, uh, you know, they'd fly over from the US and just their way of being in a room was so calming and, and so disarming that I was like, okay, there's something, there's something going on here. And what I found was that, and this is my interpretation, was that when I stopped trying to be superhuman, stopped putting this really high bar on myself, and took that pressure off me, then what actually happened was the amount of change that happened in my life and the amount of learning I was able to absorb was so much higher than when I had been pressurizing myself. It was really counterintuitive. Wow. So what you're saying is kind of when you took your foot off the pedal and stopped putting so much pressure on that's when the learning started to happen. And I guess your mind was open to receive more in that surrender. Right. And, and the ordinariness came out like, this is the way I describe it. What I was learning was I am the same as everybody else. Right. And it was kind of the rub. So the rub was, Hey, uh, yes, Ankush, you're not uh, broken. There's nothing wrong with you you're perfect, but so is everyone else. So I don't need to be better than anyone else. I just need to wake up to the fact that we're all wonderful. We're all perfect. We're all whole. And when that became my starting point, then there were less and less blockers in my way to create, to, to make, to do, you know, to try that fell out of the way. I just want to pause there for a minute and just let that sink in for people, whoever's listening. Um, you know, that's, I think, probably the key here today. And Sally Anderson did talk a bit about removing blockers, getting rid of the ne negative self-talk today as well. Um, and people were saying, can you just manage the negative self-talk? And she said, no, you've got to obliterate it. Like, you can't be dancing around it. And it sounds a bit like that's what you did. And I... I just want to pause and reflect and everyone to go, that's really such a huge step to take. Yeah, it, it, it starts from, for me, it starts from an understanding of fundamentally who we are and, and, 
and how our psychology actually works, right? So I, I was talking to a client yesterday and it was funny, just in the first kind of 20 minutes, I wrote down a few things that he believed were true about himself, right? Um, uh, I'm no good at learning, or his exact words, I'm terrible at learning, right? And he had a few other things like this, which really didn't sound to him like negative self-talk. That seemed to be based on his experience. And I invite everybody on this call or anyone on the recording afterwards to, to think about like, what's, what thoughts do you have that just, they don't look like thoughts. They look like facts because I had a lot of these facts in my life. And so maybe once again, we can get people in the chat box here and in Facebook land to pop in. What are some of the limiting beliefs or negative self chat that either you've got now and that's fine if you're open to sharing that. Cause I think once it's spoken is half the battle of dispelling it, but also maybe things in the past that you had. So please share. What are some of the things that you had self chatter that was going on? Like I'm no good at learning. I know one of mine for years was I'm no good at maths. And yet I'm a property investor, been doing that 20 years and love the math side of it. Um, so here's one, Ravi, takes me longer to learn something and get it than other people. Yes, Nosh is saying second guessing myself all of the time. And I think this is where we come back to the reticular activating system, isn't it? That what we think about, we bring about and those negative self talks, isn't that right? And push, we're actually reprogramming and then we look for evidence to prove what we're believing right um and steven's actually um posted a link to your book there which is amazing um who what are other people saying so we've got i used to think i was dumb and fat yes that i'm not good enough yeah so lots of people are resonating with that that i was very arrogant on myself yes what else what other chit chat feel free to keep having a chat there yeah and and, and the thing is that um what what's really interesting or was interesting to me to help move past this negative self-talk was not trying for me to obliterate it it wasn't about trying to stop my thoughts because i personally found it very difficult to stop thinking what i was thinking and the more i tried to stop thinking what i was thinking i often reinforced <laughs> the thought that i was trying to stop uh, it kind of had the opposite effect and, it's and whole don't think of a purple elephant <laughs> right it, it, it exactly exactly and so what was really helpful was um understanding our psychology that we're told we have something like 60 to eighty thousand thought today right and i don't know how they measure this but this is what we're told and something like two two thousand two and a half thousand are conscious thoughts so the vast majority of our thinking is unconscious. We're not even aware that we're doing it. And even with the conscious thoughts where we're aware of the thoughts, it, like we said, it's so difficult to try and you know, control them or change them. Um, you know, I tried for over a decade to do that. But what I found more, more, more effective was, was, was not trying to change them. And that doesn't mean not doing anything, but but looking more deeply into, well, where do those thoughts come from, right? And what, what Sydney Banks would say is that those thoughts come from, from, from the universe. They come from, from basically from nothing, right? It looks like they come from our past. It looks like they come from, you know, whatever. And, and of course, that can have an, a, an impact. I'm not, I'm not kind of trying to deny that, but it's about right now. So right now, any thought I'm having is, is kind of coming from nowhere and then it goes back to nowhere. And, and realizing that, that it's, this, is our, this is our experience of life. We're, we're, we're experiencing our thinking every single moment of every single day, whether you try and do something about it or not, right? And that isn't who you are. So you know, anyone that's commented over here and we've got some, some, some great things of, of these thoughts that we have, no one listens to me. I can see Jyoti saying, and I feel others dismiss my suggestions. You know, and this is an exercise that you, you guys might want to write down and, and do afterwards. Take one of your thoughts, take one of the things that you guys have written over there 
and write down five ways that the opposite is true. Just for a bit of fun, right? Um, and what you'll see, just, and it will show you, in, we can often do it quite quickly, it will show you that your thinking isn't real. It's, it's, it looks real, but it's not real. It's not who you are. So who we are is before our thinking of ourselves, right? Your thinking isn't a reflection of you because we have thoughts that I'm great. We have thoughts I'm not so great. So we have thoughts that contradict each other. So both of them can't be true. So that can't be who we are. Who we are is before the thought arises. But the, the, one of the problems I had, that one of the problems that I find a lot of people have is they latch on to thoughts. And here's the funny thing, we'll latch on to certain thoughts. More often than not, people will latch on to the negative thinking, well, that's who I am, versus in the positive. Or we make up these stories such as, um, if I have a thought more often, therefore it's more true. Or, and I couldn't agree more, even organizations, when I'm working with them, you do a SWOT analysis and straight away they go to weaknesses. And humans do have that kind of negative bias, you know, happening. Um, someone here has commented, I think it was Nosh has suggested, could you run us through an example about the five ways? So could we look at someone's example of a negative thought and then think about what are five ways that the opposite is true? Yeah, so, so let me take... Uh, my client from from yesterday and and i won't say share anything about yeah. who he is but just generically this is a person who said i'm terrible at learning um and so that was a story for him and and i didn't really know this person very well it was our first conversation and even in kind of 15 minutes into the call i found five ways that the opposite was true and i and i said like for example he had told me he'd had a number of different jobs at different companies. Well, if he was terrible at learning, he wouldn't have been able to have different jobs and different roles. So I was like, okay, so that's one. You must be good at learning. Two, he told me he went to university and he passed his degree, right? Well, if you've passed exams and you've got to a degree level, well, you must be good at learning. Three, um, he told me that uh, he had... Um, started to become a manager and manage other people, right? And managing people is a skill and you have to learn how to manage other people. And he told me he was very good at it. So you must be good at learning in order to do that. Um, and then, I mean, there's ones that are generic to everyone where he learned how to walk, he learned how to talk, he, he um, learned how to brush his teeth. I mean, I, I could literally find a hundred things to, to disprove that he's, terrible at learning right could he right. drive a car all of those things yeah right Great. And, and, that makes sense awesome <laughs> yeah so um, and and that's just a bit of a, a a fun example and you you can do this by the way with someone else in your life right so you, you can ask someone a friend or something you take one of your beliefs so i know someone said you know i'm, I'm fat and ugly right um go to your best friend and say, tell me five reasons why the opposite of that is true. And your friend will like reel them off so quick that you, you know, it, it will surprise you. Um, and the point isn't to do this with every thought that you have. It's to point out that our thinking isn't as real as we, you know, we make it out to be, isn't as true as we make it out to be. Right. So um, that's what, that's what I, I, I found for myself. And so that's what led to what I call radical transformation. Because when I'm not paying so much attention to my thinking, right, like, oh, this is really true about me. When I'm not, um, you know, getting caught up in it, then I can just go and do whatever it is that I want to do. So I'm guessing, AJ, that when you put this summit together or when you did your first um, group of seminars, there may have been some thoughts come up like, oh, are we doing the right thing? Or I'm, I'm assuming it wasn't always plain sailing the whole way through. We acted pretty quickly. It was a 
brain idea snap I had one night. I was talking to Michelle. I said, what do you think about doing a summit? And we literally put it together in two weeks. But along the way, there were a lot of technical things and getting it to work and talking to our team where we were like, ah, what the hell are we doing? Um, yeah, so there was a lot of that chitter chatter. But kind of once we have decided we're going to do something, we jump in. <laughs> right. And so what, what, I, what I see is that when, when you have those ah moments, you don't spend a lot of time getting into those oh, what have we done? And having thinking about your thinking, we shouldn't have done that, you know, and, and go down a negative spiral. Mm -hmm. you, and we all do this in certain parts of our lives. There'll be parts of our lives where we don't really pay attention to the thinking that's kind of taking us off our path. We're just like, ah, okay, right, what do we do? And we get on with it. And there'll be other parts of our lives where we don't do that. There'll be other parts of our lives where a thought comes in and we really pay so much attention to that, mm. right? So for someone, it could be they're great with their kids and they're a great parent, but at work, they get an insecure thought come up and someone says something negative to them and they take it really personally, mm. right? But at home with their kids and the kid goes, oh, I hate you, daddy. They're like, yeah, yeah, I know, come on, get to bed. And they just don't take it personally. And I'd have to say, I haven't always been able to react so quickly and just make a decision and go with it. And I know... Years ago in my corporate roles, um, one of the jobs I was in was actually really unhealthy, toxic workplace. And I knew I needed to leave. And it took me three times resigning. And it took about a year to actually leave. So, you know, I haven't always been that way. I think meditation experience life has supported me to now get quicker in the recovery and to quieten the chitter chatter. But back then I had lots of the self-limiting beliefs that were telling me you can't leave a corporate job and you know, good money and all of that, even though I knew it was killing me. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know, we that's such a testament to, to, you know, what you've done and inspiration in terms of what, what, what I'm sure you've done to other people. I can see Nosh saying about how you and Michelle have created a, done a wonderful job. And, and, you know, this is the beautiful thing. Um, you can't see it, but behind me, I've got uh, um, the Marianne Williamson poem. Um, about our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our greatest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. And, you know, to me, that ties in very nicely with what I'm saying, that when, when we wake up to that, when we wake up to we are not our thinking, we, we just experience our thinking, and who we are is before our thinking, we're, we're greater than that, then what it does is not only does it help us achieve more and do more in the world, right? But it really inspires and, and impacts other people in a really positive way, right? Um, and, and, you know, you guys are an, a, an example of that, but this is true, you know, to, to everyone. And I, and I see this constantly with, with clients of mine where when they wake up, right, to, to a little bit more about, their own psychology, then their relationship with their partner gets better, their wife or their husband. And they have, you know, and they pass it on and, it, uh, and it's like having a ripple effect outwards. And so this is another part of radical transformation that radical transformation for me is not just with you. It, it ripples outwards to absolutely everyone else who, who comes to interact with you and who, mm -hmm. who, who you interact with. I couldn't agree more. And I think even studying ancient texts like the Upanishads, um, for example, and some of those will often talk about emptying the bowl. It's one of my favorite concepts. And they say, you know, we're a vessel and we keep putting thoughts in and we muddy them with all of this clutter in our brain. And our job is actually to empty the bowl, to make space, you know, to make space for grace, to make space for God or universe or whatever you believe and for your greatness to come forward. And so I'm curious about what are some of the ways that we do do that? How do we quieten that chitter chatter and all of those things going on? I think that's such a great question. And I know that you mentioned, um, meditation i think there are a lot of great things that people can do and i i don't um prescribe any particular things for people right which might sound a bit strange what what, what i say to people is that 
in your wisdom, in your own essence, you know what works for you. And I remember I read this book on meditation years ago and the, the introduction was the best thing. And so this guy was writing about all these meditation masters, but in the introduction, he said, the person I learned the most about meditation from was from my grandfather. And my grandfather wasn't a meditation teacher. He was a farmer. And every time life would just get to him, he'd go and sit on a log. And sometimes I would sit with him and he would just sit. And then when he's, he was fine, he'd get up and he'd carry on. And so whilst this guy had then in later years gone and studied so much from all these other, other wonderful meditation teachers, he said, my grandfather, he, he was my biggest influence. And this comes back to the whole ordinary thing. And, you know, what I found was that for me, the, the more that I understood the nature of my psychology, right, the nature of my thinking, the side effect of that is a quieter mind. So, so let me, let me explain that and give you a bit of example, right? Let's say I had a thought, which I did have a thought that my self-worth depended on how much money I made, right? That used to be one of the thoughts I had, like, well, if my, if my friend earns more than me, then somehow I'm lesser than them. Right. And it's quite a common, common thought. Well, when I had that, that one thought that I then believe and turn into a belief results in so many other thoughts, right? Because at any time I meet someone, well, how much are they earning? How well are they doing? You know, how does that compare to me? Why didn't I do this? Oh, I should have taken that job last year that was paying me more. It leads to like, it has babies and those babies have babies, right? These, the, they, they kind of lead to a busier, more crazy mind. But let's say now that thought comes up, oh, I need to earn more money to be, uh, have, have greater self-worth. And I realize, well, that's just a thought. I don't need to do anything um, with that. Well, then all those kind of thought babies, they don't come up. And so my natural state of being is a quieter mind. So when you combine that with, with anything you want to do, whether you want to do meditation or not, it kind of supercharges it. I'm listening and I have this image <laughs> of mice. You know how mice breed quickly? <laughs> and that whole concept you said of your thoughts having thought babies. So now I've got all these thoughts running around like mice and they're duplicating and having lots of thought babies. And that's not always helpful. You don't want a whole heap of, you know, and so then it's making me think busy mind, lots of busy mice running around on their little treadmills. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. And, and, you know, one of my mentors, you know, I once said to him a, a few years ago, I was like, Hey, so, so what, what techniques and strategies should I put in place to, to quiet my mind even more? And, and he, he kind of laughed at me and said, uh, well, what has been the most helpful thing to quiet your mind to date? And I said, well, it's been understanding how the mind worked, right? And, and this is where I kind of really saw it. So he's like, right, so if you go deeper with that, if you start seeing even more, where have you got thoughts that you've turned into beliefs that, that really are just, they're just thoughts. They're not, they're not truths, they're not facts. Um, do you see that will, will quiet your mind even further? And that's what's happened. So, you know, e even now I'm kind of eight years into this journey and even now I will see stuff like, Oh wow. I had that as a belief, right? I really thought that was true. Whether it's, um, you know, uh, like f I had one recently around criticism, right. And it, and it looked like, um, you know, that ha really had an impact you know, to, to make me feel bad or make me feel uncomfortable. Well, if I hold that to be true for me, right, I, I, I don't do well with criticism, then it leads to a whole host of other thinking. I need to guard against criticism. I need to be superhuman so that I never get criticized. I need to, I need to, I need to, I need to. And that results in a, in a much busier mind. Whereas when I come back to, well, I'm gonna feel what I feel if I get criticized or I get praised, I'm going to feel what I feel. There's nothing I need to do about it. Nothing I need to control or do anything. I can just get on with my day and 
and those little baby mice right don't don't go off and breed right and and, and um it, it's kind of like sweeping up i like it i feel like sometimes it's like going into my brain and just you know sweeping out sweeping out all the um you know cobwebs or whatever and and you know opening the curtains and letting the light in right because we we've got all these thoughts and beliefs that we we don't real we don't even question them mm. you know and i remember when i worked in corporate i would do these personality tests right and the, which are really big in the corporate world and they would say like this is how you are and you you won't change this is the way you're always going to be and that reinforces even more the belief and stories that you have about yourself which simply aren't true so this is a lot about attachment isn't it i guess in a way and learning to be detached because often too those personality tests can really feed our ego and i know i've loved some of them in the past and you know i can remember doing myers briggs three times and going yes i'm an entj and being really super attached to that but then also um, having thoughts around wanting to be or not wanting to be, but naturally was a people pleaser. And so then if someone didn't respond, you know, enthusiastically to me or jump at something, I would be like, oh, did I not please them? Did I not make them happy? And so then there was all of that mice running around. I loved your concept of opening the curtains or the blinds. And for me, that is a walk in nature and meditation, which is kind of the daily defrag, I say, you know, cleaning up the files on the computer and getting rid of any syntax errors. Um, I'd love people to share in the chat boxes. We've got about another six, seven minutes before we move into Q&As, but I'd love for people to share if they've got some insights. We've got um, here on Facebook, um, not all thoughts require action. That's gold. They loved that. Thanks, Ankush. They said the idea that humans are flawed is flawed in itself and that brain sp spring cleaning is a magical concept. Yeah. So what do other people think here as well in Zoom as far as what are some of the mice running around in your head um, or what are some of your mechanisms also for making space in the vessel, moving your curtains away? Uh, Nosh is saying get effed to these personality tests. <laughs> Uh, good insights, but I can change and improve. Yeah, so everything's just feedback, right? Hmm. Back to right. you. And, 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 and that's the, that's the to me, that's the beauty of life, right? Because then when we see it from that perspective, then, then we just get to experience, right? Every, every single day. And, um, you know, I, I remember there's this wonderful little clip of... Um, uh, oh, I forgot his name, the, the, the Buddhist teacher, Alan Watts. And he talks about the dream of life, which I really love. And he said, you know, if you could dream your whole life in a night, then, you know, the first night you dream it, it would be perfect, right? You'd have an amazing life in, in the dream and, and every night you'd do it. But after a while, you'd kind of get bored and you would start dreaming a little bit more dangerous stuff, a little bit more stuff didn't go according to plan, a little bit less perfect. And, but every night you'd wake up in the morning and you know, it, it, it'd been a dream. And he said, eventually you would dream the exact life that you're living now. And when I, and when I listen to that, I'm like, that's so true. If, if I could, you know, after a while you, you, you would. And so life is just that, that dream life is just that experience that we're having and it's all just experience right it was all just experience and, and all of us and, and you know sometimes i say this with the thing that we think would make us happy right if that was true or the things that would make us happy then celebrities would be the most mentally healthy people on the planet as a population because they've got the beautiful partners They've got the money, they've got the fame, you know, people adore them. All, all the things that we think would, would make us happy, they've got them in spades. And yet, as a population, I don't think it's unfair to say that they're some of the most troubled, you know, people mentally that, you know, on, on the planet. So if, if, 
And then we hear the story of the grandfather sitting on the log, right? Which is that whole before enlightenment chop wood carry water, after enlightenment chop wood carry water. Yes, people are saying the challenges are the lessons in life. Um, all thoughts, if we could connect with the higher truth, we feel the peace and enjoy in the mode of silence. So there's lots of great comments coming in. Thank you, everyone. Acceptance, yeah, acceptance of circumstances. Sorry, I don't know your name. It says Lenovo, and I'm assuming that's your computer, not your name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny, even, even with acceptance of circumstances, what I find is that the deeper that I've gone with this, I don't even need to accept circumstances. Right, like because they just are. <laughs> it's kind of going even before that. Um, it's it's amazing. Um, one of my mentors used to say, it it leads to unavoidable evolution. Right, that once you see what is not true, then it's unavoidable. Right, you you can't help it. Right, it kind of like it takes the legs out of your false beliefs. So, and I used to find this all the time. So if I was ever feeling sorry for myself, well, that, that was true. And I was whatever, but now, even when I'm in the midst of it, and I'm not saying I'm perfect and I don't get caught out, but there's this little voice in my head that goes, you know, this is just a thought. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you, you, you know, this isn't fact. And so it's kind of unavoidable that what it's like, it's like the matrix. Once you, once you see it, you can't, you can't unsee that. And I know I had uh, a great meditation teacher say to me once to just see the thoughts as clouds floating by and to almost put the thought into the clouds so to just go, oh, look, it goes another one. <laughs> oh, look. Um, and also to relabel them instead of, oh, you stupid or whatever, to just go, isn't that interesting? And it's so kind of unloaded then. It doesn't have the same um, energy around it. If you can just go, oh, isn't that interesting? There goes another thought. <laughs> and to just keep putting them on the clouds and letting them go by. So we've got about three or so minutes left, um, Ankush. Any final kind of summary and things you want to share before we do open up and see if anyone has any questions for you? Well, I, I just hope this has been really helpful for people and, and that what I say is that if, if this resonates, I mean, I'm, I'm under no... Um, illusion that all of a sudden I'm going to do one webinar and people are going to go, all oh, right, yeah, I get it. It's all my thinking. So I really encourage people that, you know, things like this are great. And it's, it's a great jumping off point for deeper exploration for yourself. And I always say to people, um, you, you trust yourself in this. So, you, you know, um, I point people to, to trust what's right for them. And so if you think, right, Ankush is talking a load of bleep, right? Then, then great, move on. There's, there's no problem. But if there's something that you're hearing that makes sense, and you know, I've suggest, made some suggestions to people around that, I would really encourage for your, for yourself and for those in your life to really explore this deeper. And it's a beautiful thing that when we, to, to me, it's kind of like a win-win. So um, even when I, when I work with people. Um, you know, who are, um, you know, in relationship struggles, I I'll say to them, let's, let's look at what's going on in your psychology. Let's forget about the other person. And, and it, I've had it with clients that they've seen more deeply about their own thinking in a situation where they were so close to getting divorced and it's, and they've completely gone 180 degrees, you know, like they've just turned around. Um, so, th so it's like, be selfish in looking at this for yourself because that's the most beautiful thing you can do for other people. Oh, I love that. What a beautiful way to end. And I know in working with lots of workplaces on their culture, um, often, and especially I've worked in regulators where they're actually trained and paid to find fault with things, you know, when you send an email and they have to send it back with a typo corrected or something to encourage cultures like that to then say, catch people doing something right. Like for the first thing you do in the day, catch someone doing something right. And as soon as we start doing that, our lens of the world shifts to actually looking for more of those things that are right. Um, so can anyone, uh, if you've got questions, can you please pop them in the Q and A or here in the chat box, um, Facebook, if you've got anything, 
um, people are saying lots and, and just lots of love hearts, simply superb, real insight into reality. I know I, for one, loved the whole idea of writing down, you know, the negative thought or the thought that I'm caught up on and then writing five things that were the opposite of that. That was really helpful. I um, appreciate people when they do things well, personal, professional and being genuine. Yeah, Ankush is certainly very genuine. And I love that concept of trust what's right for you, that there's no right or wrong way. And I think a lot of people hand away their power to a therapist or a coach or someone because they think they've got all the answers and the only people that ever have the answer is ourself, right? Mm. Yeah, one, one of my mentors would say, um, you, you know, if you're t telling people to trust their wisdom, then, then don't be the person who says, trust your wisdom, except when it disagrees with me, then trust my wisdom, right? He goes, that doesn't, that doesn't really make sense. And I, I'll never forget that because it's so true. And so maybe in the last uh, one or two minutes, could people write into the chat box, what are you going to do? How are you going to think differently? Or what's an action you can take? Or just a belief that you're going to let go of? Or something you're going to contemplate after tonight's talk? It's been another huge day here, day five at the summit. And, and I think it's really useful to co-create and be here together. But it's also really useful to go away and think, well, now that that's simmering, what am I going to do? Um, so Nosh is saying, I'm going to work on the five ways. Yeah, that whole idea of questions. Um, we've got... Isabella is saying sensational talk really enjoyed appropriate for all ages. I'll be sharing this with my nieces and nephews. So they're on the right path. That's beautiful. And I was actually thinking very similarly, this would be great for children. And even that five ways, you know, especially in the days now of cyberbullying or people picking on someone at school to go, well, what are five ways that that's not true for you? Yeah. Um, yeah. Are saying, go for it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I was, I was going to say that this is, I think children get this more easily than, than even adults. And if we look, you know, um, uh, if I can do a minor plug, uh, my book over here, um, one of the things that I write in my book that I, I share what us. I'm talking about. Uh, so this is the draft copy, but with all my notes in it, but uh, yeah. that it's called Sweet Sharing, Rediscovering the Real You. Um, so the start of that book is, is really a story about when I was a, a young child and how, when I was a young child, I didn't have confidence issues and I didn't have, you know, um, poor me and I didn't feel a ton of insecurity and, and, and I tell a story which really illustrates that. Um, and so we're all born that way. And if anyone's got really young children or nieces and nephews, you'll see, you know, up until, you know, a few years old, you know, you ask them, who's the best at singing? Me, 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 right? Who, 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 who's the most creative? Me, who's the best at dancing? Me, right? They, they don't have, you know, that the, their thinking doesn't get in their way. And, and if they have a tantrum, they have the tantrum. And, and, you know, again, parents will know this. They're fine after a couple of, <laughs> a couple of minutes. They don't hold on to it. So we're all born completely mentally healthy. So, uh, uh, you, you know, all of us. So that's, that kind of, to me, was a real practical way of explaining how this is not just a nice idea that, hey, we're all perfect, blah, 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 right? It, it was like, no, think about back to your own life, what you were like when you were two, three, four years old, or ask your parents and, you know, they'll, they'll tell you. That we're all born perfect, right? We're all bought and perfect. Someone's asking what was the name of your book. It was called Sweet Sharing, isn't it? Sweet, sweet sharing. And and again, if you if you read the first uh, chapter, that the title makes sense because it's about me sharing some sweets uh, <laughs> with somebody. Um, and, really and the subtitle is a great book, well worth reading. Um, other people are saying stop being so hard on myself, more being not doing. Yes. Um, I agree with the five ways. I'll look for something positive in others. I think often being of service is a great way and just being enough, remembering the gardener more often. I like how he didn't feel the need to go into any flurry of activity. Yeah, to just sit with the calm. Because isn't it always the way it's in the shower or on a walk when we get the best ideas or the solutions to challenges and things when we quieten those little mice down? <laughs> um, Stephen's just posting a link um, on Amazon 
to um, Kusha's book, which is amazing. Thank you, Stephen. And we'll be sure to copy that across and I'll paste it into the Facebook group as well. So all of you in Facebook land um, can check that out as well. Um, thank you so, so much for wrapping up what's been an epic day here, day five on the Superhuman Summit, Ankush. It's beautiful to have you join us all the way from London. And it's probably now like 11 o'clock in the morning. So um, you're probably well and truly into your day. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the people who are joining. Um, I've got a question here, podcast with a question mark. Do you have a podcast, Ankush, or um, other ways people can find you or is LinkedIn or somewhere best? Yeah, probably the best place is my website, which is um, Um, ankushjane.co.uk. a n k u s h j a i n dot co dot uk and I I've done a couple of podcasts I've done one on relationships and I've got forty six episodes where I've interviewed a bunch of my mentors um, around relationships which which I've got a lot of lot of love for that um, and then I've done a smaller podcast with a, a few episodes but around how this impacts business and corporations and and how some of my colleagues are, are taking this into into corp in the corporate world. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I release a lot of content. So yeah, if you just go to my website or you check me out on Facebook, the, there's loads of stuff out there. Thank you. And thanks to everyone, Faith and Stephen and Nosh and Anush and people who are saying hello and thank you. Thanks to everyone in Facebook land who were listening in. Really appreciate it. Join us tomorrow. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Amazing. Look at that. Speakers on for tomorrow. So we begin again at 7.40 Australian Sydney time, Australian Eastern Standard Time for our daily meditation. And then first up tomorrow, our speaker is Joe Formosa, who's talking about the five health mistakes that you may be making. Thank you so much for your generous sharing. It's been blissful. Thank you to everyone who tuned in and please feel free to jump over to the Facebook group, which is called the Superhuman Summit and we'll be sure to post all the links there as well so you can download and have a look where Ankush's books and LinkedIn are and also everyone from all of the sessions and speakers have been jumping in there and answering questions as well which has just been a gift so keep being you keep being amazing thank you all have a great evening bye for now thank you AJ thank you for having me on here